Let's talk a little bit about what Adam was just talking about there. Huge uncertainty. The Prime Minister is laying that out. What does that mean in terms of the way you're viewing the economy and the way it's going to develop over the next few months? Listen, it means we're entering a phase where every percentage point counts. I mean, we, we had a drop down of 20-25% last year. We recovered most of that. But the question now is whether we'll recover to 100% or only 99% and how much will we lose along the way. And I think at that stage of the recovery, every bit of certainty counts. And what I heard a lot from you guys here in the summary is uncertainty. Nobody really knows, and that doesn't necessarily help. We don't know whether a passport is the best way forward, but at some point, decisions need to be taken for mm -hmm. the economy to be able to function within a given framework. And I think, you know, when we ask ourselves, why has the UK been hit worse than other countries? Why has the UK had more recourse to furlough than others in a, in a more prolonged way, possibly this uncertainty, the, the fact that, you know, the government, but also everybody else, didn't really know what to do with the situation may have played a role. So at this stage, I think, we need the government to, to step up, to give us uh, uh, guidelines, to give us, uh, uh, you know, maybe not rules and regulation or strict lockdowns, but at yep. least uh, ways to but function. It, you know, and, yeah. Fabrice, I was going to say that it, it does seem, though, that uncertainty is part of what we're dealing with with the virus, particularly if it becomes endemic. We're just going to have to get sort of uh, seasonal shots, or we don't know how long it's going to take unnecessarily to eradicate, and if we'll have a hybrid recovery or a stay-at-home recovery. Fabrice, how do you model growth on that? Absolutely. Listen, we, we are always obviously hesitating between... <laughs> Uh, uh, a situation where COVID becomes a permanent feature or, or only a cyclical feature. Um, uh, but e either way, we have a lot of viruses that are around every year. We, we kind of learn to operate uh, within that framework. The, the thing I was questioning here is that w we need that framework. Everybody needs that framework, right? Um, once, once we have it, whether you operate with uh, uh, vaccine passports, uh, whether you operate with uh, given rules to travel, uh, once that is in place, the economy is able to plan ahead. And I think that's missing right now. Uh, do we know how to plan ahead in the next six months or a year? We, we don't. And I think that, that, that would be something that's helpful. And, you know, it's not only about the virus. Think about the fiscal plans. I mean, mm. for now... The only thing we're left are tax increases, and which, which, which are good or not, let, let me not judge this now, but uh, we also desperately need something that shows us the way out of this crisis, you know, new spending, new, new opportunities. I mean, we're talking about yeah. climate change, but we, we desperately need a roadmap here, a, a more credible roadmap out of, uh, or, or rather into that transition, and that's also missing. So. What, what is the base case over the next few months on the employment picture? Um, do higher vaccinations mean higher employment? Does the supply side of the labour market start to come back? Do we understand at this stage, when the furlough scheme ends, yeah. are we going to see a, sp a, a big spike in unemployment? And how is that going to distort maybe the data that we're looking at now? Listen, what we like in this morning's data, for instance, is that we have uh, uh, the certainty, or at least we have more confidence, that this economy is on the right track. We are creating jobs every month now, already for a couple of months. And that's, you know, a, a, big, a, a big reassurance going ahead. Now, as you point out, uh, the end of furlough will be the crash test for this recovery and whether or not uh, uh, workers will, will go back to their, yep. to, 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 to their, to their jobs. Right now, uh, and I think quoting Governor Bailey, it's all about filling the jobs. So jobs are there. It's just about uh, workers having possibly something else to do. Let's see well, how it happens in September, October. But ju just to finish on that idea, I think we need to be clear that that process doesn't happen overnight. It takes a couple of weeks. It takes a couple of months. And that's OK. Remember the previous crisis. It took 10 years for the labor market to feel somewhere close to hot or, or running hot, right? Well, so if it takes a couple of quarters, we should be happy about Fabrice, that. Fabrice, that's just dealing with, say, COVID and the furlough scheme. But the other wild card is Brexit and sort of what that did to the labor market market. So even if the furlough scheme runs off, even if these companies and these industries raise wages, what part of it is structural now? Listen, the way we approach this is that part of the reason we are cautious, part of the reason we may be below consensus in some of our forecasts is because of Brexit. Mm. Brexit is a 
pr is a price that you pay over several years. You know, it hasn't been paid any given quarter or, or, or at some point in the past. It's something that will stay with us for longer. And in the current context, what's important to have in mind, I think, is that Brexit just makes everything worse. It makes labor market shortages worse. It, it, worse. it makes international travel worse. It makes supply chain disruptions worse. So uh, in our forecast, we do have something, think about half a point of GDP every year. That is for us a reason to be uh, you know, below uh, uh, others' forecast because we think that's the price of Brexit any given year. right? And, and as you say, that's going to have an inflationary impact. You, you highlighted the areas in which the economy is, is producing some of that inflation right now. The labour market, we're seeing supply shortages. We're going to get data on inflation. Um, do you think for the... For the you, you referenced Governor Bailey. Do you think for the Bank of England the inflation box has already been ticked? I.e. inflation is already high enough to justify a policy response, where they're basically a bit like the Fed, almost, just waiting for the labour market to become a little bit clearer before they can actually start taking policy action. So listen, I wouldn't be on that line because for me the, the, the only box that the Bank of England ticked is the fact that inflation is temporary. We heard temporary uh, repeatedly in their statements. So we, whether it peaks at 3, 4, 5% is irrelevant at this stage as long as you can make the point that it's falling back in line with your target afterwards. And that's what it's doing in the bank's forecast even taking unchanged interest rates. So that's where a little bit of confusion is, in my view, on what the Bank of England is actually saying. Is it saying that it has seen enough to be, to be happy to hike, or is it saying something, something else? Remember years ago with Governor uh, Carney, we already were in a situation where the MPC liked to promise a hike, yeah. but tended to under-deliver on that hike. Uh, I think structurally the MPC likes to think that there's a normal normalization path, and mm -hmm. that path in, uh, uh, implies higher rates. But whenever that happens, or if that happens, that's another story. So in my view, labor market is, is one element of that. But take uh, activity in the second quarter. We are now on course for something that looks like 1.5% or 2% growth in, in the third quarter, sorry, yep. in the third quarter. And the bank is forecasting 2.9, was forecasting 3.9 before taking into account uh, uh, the Delta surge. So we are way off the mark on growth. So we are in this policy trade-off between talking tough against inflation, but uh, uh, talking in contrast to activity data that for now is disappointing.